Hello, this is Clint Halstead, and this is uh, Introduction to Microprocessors. Uh, I'm using, again, the Designing Embedded Systems with PIC Microcontrollers, Principles and Applications, Second Edition with Tim Wilmshurst. <clears throat> Today we're going to be talking about uh, program memory and the stack. We'll be going over section 2.3 and 2.4 of the book. Also, we'll cover data memory and special function registers interfacing with peripherals and talk about the configuration word. So the uh, program memory and stack look similar to this diagram. So the program memory is made up out of flash, flash memory which is non-volatile memory which means that uh, you know when the power is removed from your from the chip, then it remembers the the values. The program the program memory is a section of the chip where your your actually your code exists. So your assembler language code or your C code exists in this section here um, called called the flash. Okay, and you can see here that we have. <coughs> from 0 to 3FF of this user memory space, program memory space. Um, <coughs> your instructions are here. Each You have each uh, memory ad address location, even though they're not all shown, these numbers go from 0, 0, 0, 0, hex to 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 0, 0 3, 0, 0, 0, 4, and then it just continues to go on up even though they're not labeled. So you have a thousand uh, memory locations in order to, to store your code. <coughs> Notice that uh, 3FF, remember FF is, represents um, eight ones. So FF hex represents eight binary ones, which also represents 256 decimal. So 256, and notice that we have, we, we're going to have four of those because we have 0, 1, 2, and 3 because it goes all the way up to, to 3 FF. That means it has, you have 0, uh, 0 FF, which is 256, and you have 1 FF, 2 FF, and 3 FF. So that's uh, 1,000, you know, if you, if you take 256 times 4, it gives you roughly 1,000. So you have 1,000 different memory locations in order to, to store your code. So as long as your code isn't longer than that, then it will fit in this space. If you need more code space, then you have to go up to a, a, part, a different PIC microcontroller that has more uh, program memory space or flash. So also notice here that we have, we have se several features of the program memory in the stack. First thing we have is there's three pieces three main pieces. We have the program counter, we have the stack, which we'll talk about later, and then we have, or we'll talk about in just a few minutes. So we have the program counter, the stack, and then we have the program memory, which is the, the flash. And now the program counter points to the program memory. So the, the program counter contains your next instruction. So when power is reset on the chip, or when you first power it up, the program counter is set to zero, which means it's pointing to the very first location, uh, which is zero, and then this is where your code has to start. <coughs> so also notice you have, uh, you also have an interrupts, interrupt service routine that, that must start at 0004, and we'll talk about that later on in the book, but not uh, today. So if you have an external pin that's an interrupt. If that pin goes high, it creates an interrupt, and then your code will instantly go to this place, and so you need to put any sort of interrupt code here. So typically what people do is they, uh, if they're not going to use interrupts, they, they reset to zero, and then they put a go to instruction a as the first instruction. So it's a go to down here, and then you can start your code from that point. So you need to, to skip this peripheral interrupt vector. So that's just a little tip. We'll learn again more about that later. Uh, next thing that we want to notice here is we've already talked about this. A program must start here at zero. 
and the program counter points to the locations in the program memory. So the program counter points here. Now the question is, what is this stack? And the best way I can describe the stack is um, it's just a you got some SRAM here that will the program counter will be copied to this stack, and the stack is just some some RAM some memory, and this memory is called a LIFO. The book talks about it on page 37. It's a last in first out. Last in first out just means that the last thing that you put in the stack is the first thing that, that comes out. So um, <clears throat> if you, for example, if you, they kind of describe it as being stacking plates. You know, if you stack a bunch of plates, the last plate you put down is, is also the first plate you're going to pick up when you grab it. You're not going to grab the plate from the bottom. You're going to grab it from the top. So that's another reason they call it a stack. And the best way I can describe the stack is the stack is used during function calls. So when you're in, down here using your program and you're you're running sequentially in your code, if you have a go to statement or a call statement, I mean rather, a call statement. What a call statement does is it takes the it remembers the place that you're at, the current value of the program counter. Let's say that you um, I, I think about it also as a, as reading a book. You can think of it as flipping through the pages of a book. Um, and each page of the book, you know, ha can represent uh, the address that you're at. So let's say you're going down through here, and you're executing instructions to address 20. Um, you could think of that as being reading through a, a book, and then on page 20 of the book, it says, "Well, I want you to go to page uh, 50." So if you go to page 50, you need to remember that you're on page 20. So you need to remember that you're at address location 20. So if you jump down here to 50, you execute the instructions at 50, but then when you ha get a return statement, you have to remember where you you have to go back to. So you have to go back to 20. So that's kind of a way to remember. It's the same way when you're reading a textbook. When you're reading along and there's a reference to another page, you have to go to the other page, but you want to also remember where you are at so that you can continue reading your text. Uh, later on, so that's kind of the way it works. Is is that the uh, the stack when there's a call function, it it jumps to the location where your your program is at in the in the in the your in your code. So it's going to jump to the new location, um, but it needs to remember. So it pushes that we call that pushing the value to the stack. So let's say that you're you're executing code to you get to 20 and then you get a call function to another location what's well, going to push that location of 20 onto the stack now you're going to go execute your code down here at a different location and then when you get a return it's going to what we call pop it's going to pop that 20 value back to the program counter so that you you can go back and continue executing your code so it's called when you put something on the stack or when you put the program counter on the stack it's called pushing when you pull it back off then it's called popping so push and pop. Okay. And go ahead and read the textbook if you need more information on that. The next thing we'll talk about is data memory and uh, special function register map. Now the data memory is stored in the SRAM portion. The SRAM is, is volatile memory which means that uh, th these values are lost you know, once the power is removed from the chip. Okay, so these do not get remembered. So it basically means your your code uh, your code typically sets these values as the as the program is running. So as the program is running here in your non-volatile memory in your flash, uh, you're going to code that so that it sets these values the way you want. So it doesn't really matter that these values go away when power goes away because your program is going to control these registers anyway. So, from that perspective, uh, you know you don't really need to worry about it. So you don't really need this to be non-volatile memory. Um, but anyway, these are called your special function registers. So your your data memory section is from zero um, to seven F. But um, whether or not this part down here is grayed out depends on what type of chip you have. So if you have a larger chip, then you may have memory space all the way down to 7FH or 7F uh, hex. 
but for the uh, 16F84 uh, we only have from 0 to 4F. Okay, so that means we have 68 general purpose registers. If we had, um, and notice that it goes from, it goes on both sides, you have two banks. So if you had a larger chip that had all of these available, then you would have up to 256 because FF represents 256. Um, and 7F represents 128. So um, bank 0 has 128 locations, bank 1 has another 128 locations. If you add those together, it gives you 256 locations. Um, but notice that the first few uh, from 0 to 0B are reserved. Uh, the rest of these you can write whatever values you want to these uh, and you can define them to what you want. But the first 0 to, 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 to zero, 0 to 0 B are called special function registers. Uh, this, is, this is for the timer, this is for the this is the program counter low value, this is the status register, this is the file select register for indirect addressing, this is port A which controls uh, your, your uh, port A on your chip. Port B uh, controls port B, which is your pins on your chip, your parallel port. Then you have EE data, that's your um, EE prom uh, memory location data and EE prom address. Um, and then you have some internet uh, interrupt registers. Um, then when you go to bank when you go to this other side to bank one, you actually the only way you can get there is you have to set the bank select bit in the status register to one. Um, I believe that's bit bit five of the status register. You have to set to one in order to go over here. And then once you get that bank select select register set, then you go ahead and you 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 address uh, location zero, but that'll give you uh, eight zero. So. Um, it's, it's a little confusing, but once you see, if you have to have the bank select register set to zero to get to this side, and you have to have the bank select bit set to one to get to this side over here. Um, once we do a lab, we'll um, we'll understand that a little bit better. So the option register, you have to be you have to have the bits select uh, the bank select bit set to one. But once you do, then you can get over here to the option register. Um, notice that some of these are the same. So notice that the program counter low is the same whether you're on bank 0 or bank 1. Same with the status re register, same with the file select register. But notice that um, for the port A, when you have the bank select bit 1, then you have this trist A function instead of port A. So you have the trist A controls the direction for port A. So if you, so what that means is if you want, do you want your port A to be inputs or outputs? So that's what's being set by the trist A, whether or not the port A is input or output, because you can't really have both. You, you typically have your ports are either one way or another. It is possible to have a bi-directional port, but you would have to control that somehow through software, through a read-write bit or something like that. But for a lot of simple, app, simple applications, they're usually either set to either inputs or outputs. So that's the trist A is how you control those. And then your EE address, uh, EE prom um, data, you control with these EE control registers, one and two. Um, and so that's about it for that. So that's your data memory and special function register map. Now, when you want to interface with peripherals, uh, you, you do that with, through the special function control registers, which means these registers like trist A, trist B, and then the data transfer special function register, which would be port A and port B. So those are examples of, of this kind of diagram. This is a generic diagram of showing you how do you get to the outside world. You got this microcontroller core, and you got your program space over here, and your program code, and you're wanting to get to this outside world, which may be an LED or an LCD panel, liquid crystal display, or um, a variety of other things. But uh, the way you, the interface between those the outside world and the internal processor core are your uh, special function registers, um, and your data your data so your your control special function and your data transfer special function. So you got two registers here that you need to control. And then you know sometimes your outside world you have some interrupts that come into your microprocessor. <coughs> 
So the peripherals can be configured in software to operate in a number of modes. Uh, and you do this to do this. Certain control data must be set, set sent to them to set them up in the desired way. Once in use, there will be data flow between core and peripheral. Uh, there may still be need for further uh, control data. These needs are commonly met by means of dedicated memory, memory registers, sometimes called special function registers. This approach gives a microcontroller manufacturer greater flexibility to extend the microcontroller family. Um, <clears throat> so, now we're going to continue on to the configuration word. Configuration word is an important part of the microcontroller as well. It determines certain operating features of the microcontroller. It is in program memory, but cannot be accessed in normal operation. Okay, so you get this special word in here. It's written to during the programming process. So the only way to control this configuration word is when you program the chip. When you connect your PICKIT 3 or PICKIT 2, whatever you're using, to your processor and program it through your MP Lab software, uh, there's a special uh, menu at the top uh, where you can control this. Um, but this is not, and, and many times you can add this uh, some code, some lines of code uh, to your software program, your assembler or C, and you can get these bits to be changed as well. They're called assembler directives. So you can add these assembler directives at the head of your program in order to get these to be set. But these are some pretty important bits here. Um, we have code protect bits. Code protect bits will prevent someone from stealing your, your software. So if you spend a lot of time designing some software for a PIC microprocessor or if a company does, and then you spend you know months and months developing it and then your competitor just simply takes your chip and then just reads all your software, um, then they can just steal your code. And uh, whereas you would put spend a lot of money developing that, then they could just steal it. So the code protection bit prevents them from being able to read that back. It also prevents you from being able to read that back, but uh, you don't really need to read that back, I guess. It's not really that important. Um, it would be important during debug process, but once you got the program working the way you want it and in manufacturing, and you're going to program all these chips to go to sell them, then you would probably want to enable the code protection. So a zero represents that all the memory is code protected. So if these are all ones, then it would there would be no code protection. So you also have bit three. You have a power up enable bit. You have a watchdog timer enable bit. Many times the watchdog timer needs to be disabled when you do many things. So uh, this is a common thing that you would disable would be the watchdog timer. And then everyone needs to know how to set the oscillator because the chip won't work if you don't have an oscillator. So if you have any errors when you first start trying to use a chip, uh, I would check the watchdog timer and the oscillator. Um, the RC oscillator is the one that's internal to the oscillator. And then you have these uh, high speed options, uh, XT, LP, low power option. Um, so these last three here are external oscillator options and the, the RC one is the internal oscillator. If your processor has an internal oscillator, not all of them do. So you have to check your device data sheet to see if you have an, an RC oscillator. Um, so a good exercise here would be to go for the 16F84A would be to look at the data sheet and tell me whether or not uh, this chip has an RC internal oscillator. If it doesn't, you have to add an external oscillator uh, crystal and uh, wire that up and configure that. That's it for this section. Uh, the next section is going to cover section 2.5 to 2.7. Thank you very much.